This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Indeed, this is World AIDS Day Worldwide and you are listening via Joy 94.9 or perhaps at worldaidsdayworldwide.org. It's nice to have your company wherever you may be listening. It is 10 a.m. here in Melbourne, 7 a.m. in Singapore and if you're listening from San Francisco, it's 3 p.m. on Saturday the 30th of November. Welcome wherever in the world you may be listening. We are certainly very excited to hear from you wherever you are, so please do let us know. You can email at any time on air at joy.org.au or join the Twitter conversation with hashtag joywad. Keep those interactions coming. It is always nice to hear. Now, the topic for this hour is all about where are we headed? And particularly when we look at funding, we know that uh, globally... HIV is a multi-billion dollar industry. But where does the money go and where does it come from? Well, of course, large corporations and philanthropic donations contribute millions, if not billions of dollars to the global response to HIV. But is it enough? Is the money being wasted? Is it being spent in the right ways? Or is it being contributed to the correct causes? It's really what we're going to be speaking about uh, this hour and a whole lot more. And we've got some uh, pretty important guests, the first of which is Amory O'Keefe. And Amory has extensive experience in international relations and development. She's worked in Asia, Africa and the Pacific in various roles, including as Australia's ambas- ambassador to Nepal. She's also Australia's first ambassador for HIV AIDS and the uh, Deputy Director General of Australia's International Aid Program. Currently, she's working extensively on the international response to HIV AIDS and is a member of the AIDS 2014 Coordinating Committee, as well as the local co-chair for the conference's subcommittee on leadership and accountability. Anne-Marie, welcome to Joy 94.9. Oh, thanks a lot. Good to be here. It's uh, really good uh, to speak to you today. Now, when we, we talk about funding, uh, what are the main areas you think that um, we uh, are, are kind of working at in this in this uh, realm? Well, you know, can, can I just take a couple of steps back here? Sorry, sure. I wasn't able We're having a little bit of trouble uh, hearing Anne-Marie there, so we're going to try and uh, get her back on the line. Please do, as I say, join the conversation at any time. You can just uh, email on her at joy.org.au or use the hashtag joyworldaidsday. You might be listening uh, via Joy94.9 or perhaps you're um, online at worldaidsdayworldwide.org. As I say, we are talking all about funding this hour under the topic of where are we heading uh, where does the funding come from and where does it go, Anne-Marie, you there? All right, uh, uh, we're having a few difficulties that we'll get back to Anne-Marie very soon. Um, earlier t- uh, this week, uh, Byron, uh, Brian Andy spoke with uh, Christoph Ben, who is the Director of External Relations uh, at the Global Fund, all in relation to... Okay, we are actually going to an interview from yesterday. Um here we go, from Fed Square. Hi, it's James Finlay here for Joy down here at Fed Square with Fiona Davidson from YEAR, the Communications and Campaign Manager. Uh, YEAR stands for Youth Empowerment Against HIV and AIDS. Such a fantastic day you've had here today. You must be proud. Yeah, we're really happy with how it's come along. Um, it was fantastic to be working for the first time with um, Living Positive Victoria and the Victorian AIDS Council as well. So it's been a real collaboration to get here and get the condom castle down here. And we've had dozens and dozens of volunteers coming down. And it's been a really good energy great crowd we had a couple of big speakers and yeah it's been a really good day and we've had I've overheard some really nice conversations there's been a lot of education about um, particularly the difference between the HIV and AIDS um, we've been talking about a lot of stats kind of global stats um, the 34 million people still living with HIV the 200 new infections that are happening every hour um, but particularly to give it a real context in Melbourne um, the host of the host city of the International AIDS Conference next year That's right. we've been talking about some kind of national stats and obviously that um, alarming statistic that we saw um, come out in October from the Kirby Surveillance Report that there's been a 10% increase in new HIV um, infections in the last 12 months. So we've been really sharing that with people, letting people know that HIV is still here and that while it is very alarming that um, 
with a combined effort of education and prevention and treatment and awareness, um, an HIV-free generation is possible. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and you work a lot with uh, youth empowerment, obviously. Uh, what are some of the things that you're going to be doing uh, now and that you're going to be doing in the future when it comes to educating uh, youth about HIV and yep. AIDS? So our um, organisation is a peer education organisation. So we train young people um, to become peer educators in HIV and sexual health with a really strong safe sex message. Um, so they go in groups into schools, into community organisations um, and educate around HIV and sexual health. Um, on a broader level, we also advocate really widely for, um, you know, inclusive um, and comprehensive sexual health education to be included in the Australian National Curriculum, um, which will be rolled out across all schools. So that's part of the health and PE curriculum. Um, so we've pushed really hard with the government um, and with advocacy bodies to include more sexual health education um, in an inclusive way. Um, and obviously... Um, yeah, just really pushing a really strong safe sex message. Um, and it's not just about kind of the physical side to sexual health, it's about sexual well-being. it's about consent and respect and healthy relationships um, and just having a really positive approach to sexuality so that we remove some of the stigma and the taboo about talking about sexuality so that it's um, not something that people have to feel ashamed of or to hide because that's when um, there's a lack of awareness. Yeah, you must feel like that there is so much work that uh, is ahead of you. Is that a little bit daunting because the youth figures for infection of HIV are, are rising so fast? It must be, uh, is it a little bit daunting for you and your organisation? Um, I mean, I guess that could be said of any kind of non-profit sort of charity awareness raising stuff um, when you've got such a huge issue to tackle. But I think it's really, there's a really hopeful kind of energy at Yeah, and we, um, we reach a huge amount of people. I mean, along with the... Um, workshops that we do in schools and these public awareness raising events, awareness raising events, sorry. We also um, uh, have a really good relationship with a couple of music festivals that we go along to. Um, so sort of Groove in the Moo, um, Bass in the Grass in Darwin and we head along and sort of see 20,000 young people in hits at a time um, and we find that people are really starting to be willing to talk about it and to talk about it in a way that's respectful and serious but also removing some of that taboo. So um, I think, yeah, no, we know it is a big, it's a big challenge but it's also, we have seen sort of in the last few years even, a change in the attitude towards it and can really feel that kind of change happening. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, hopefully you can uh, continue to ride this wave of, of awareness and uh, all the best and congratulations on today, Thank Brianna. Thank you very much. Thanks. Brianna Davidson here at Fed Square for Joy 94.9. James Finlay there speaking with Brianna Davidson earlier this week at Federation Square. You are listening to Joy 94.9. This is Glenn Dalton. And this, after, uh, this morning we're talking about where are we headed in relation to funding uh, around the response to HIV AIDS. Uh, where are we headed and uh, where does the funding come from and where does it go? Uh, we had a few difficulties, but um, I believe, Anne-Marie, uh, you are there? Yes, yes, I am. Oh, it's good to yeah. hear you loud and clear there, yeah, Anne-Marie. I, uh, I, um, I live in the centre of Sydney, in Belmain, actually, oh. and you wouldn't believe it, but the, the internet and the mobile connection here is worse than uh, remote Australia, I'm was, I was, I was sure of that. That's a, um, that's a, a conversation in itself, but um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, your background, Anne-Marie. Uh, yeah, sure. Look, um, I, I worked, uh, as, you, as you said in the intro, I worked in um, international development for a long time. And um, the, the, last, uh, the last few years of it, I, uh, I focused a lot on the uh, international response to HIV and AIDS. And I guess that's, uh, that's the, um, the, the point, in a way, that uh, I wanted to make. Um, HIV internationally isn't isn't viewed unfortunately but the reality is it isn't viewed as the emergency it it was viewed as in the mid 2000s right so it's actually changed pretty rapidly in the last kind of 5 or 6 years are you saying yeah pre very much so i mean you know in the it's it's there it's in headlines in the millennium development goals and uh, and they were they were developed in uh, you know the late 1990s and agreed to in in 2000 and that's a real reflection of what was happening with HIV in the 1990s um, and then you know the decade that followed was really seen as the decade to actually make a huge difference to defeating HIV and AIDS and uh, you you'll see that there was significant financial resources flowing into into that response. 
you even got uh, the creation of a dedicated fund, the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, because there was such frustration internationally uh, with the slowness of the response, not just to HIV, but the other two big killers in the developing world, which are tuberculosis and, uh, and malaria. So you had, you had a tremendous effort to actually uh, get, get the financial resources that were required. It, this also coincided with uh, a period of prosperity, at least among the Western donors. So you had what I often call a bit of a race to the top of the, the, um, the giving list mm. by the big countries. Um, in 2005, there was a very important G8 meeting in Glen Eagles where there was uh, a lot of promising made to support international development, not just HIV, but HIV was going to benefit significantly from this big determination by the world's powers, as they were at the time, to um, to international de development, including aid. Now, you know, three years later, there was the global financial crisis. Yeah. And now for the last three years, um, the flows in international development assistance or foreign aid have continued to decline. Uh, if you look at the European donors who have been very much the mainstay behind a lot of the support for HIV in the past, um, you know, there's only a couple that haven't maintained or haven't been able or have been able, I should say, to, to maintain their aid budgets. And so you're getting important donors not able to actually set up, step up to the plate, or not willing when they've got such uh, big domestic priorities they've got to deal with, as they see their own financial resources dwindle before their eyes, and you know you've got huge unemployment problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that just sort of gives you a bit of a backdrop mm. to to what's been happening in terms of funding. On top of that, you know, there's a huge, huge amount. We know that that still has to be done in HIV and AIDS, and there's no getting away from that. But there has been some success, and, and I think it's important to recognise the success. And it, that success has actually uh, brought with it a certain degree of, um, if you like, uh, feeling amongst some governments that the job's done. Mm, I, I wondered that when you when we talk about or when you're talking about the fact that the um, amount of aid that has got into this area has uh, rapidly decreased over you know the past five, six, seven years, and and perhaps you know, there's on one sense the financial strain as in relation to the global financial crisis and so on, but it, it, there's also an attitude change that's gone along with that, isn't there? Yeah, the, the, there hasn't been a huge rapid decrease over the mm. last five, six years. It's more a trend that we're seeing, right. which I think yep. is going to accelerate rather mm -hmm. than um, turn around. Uh, so, you know, this is something that we, we all have to be very conscious of. And you're right about the attitude. That's changed enormously, you know. Um, trying to maintain that strong and high-profile political will amongst current leaders. I mean, you know, God bless him, Bill Clinton's still out there on the front line. Mm. But it's been a while since Bill Clinton was president. Yes. And, you know, no one, no one else, frankly, of his ilk has, stepped up to the plate while still being a current head of head of government wherever. So, you know, where are they? And and I think part of the problem is that there are too many other competing priorities on government's plates. And um, with a stabilization and there has been a stabilization in in the 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 trend of the epidemic, at least in a number of countries, um, there's this feeling that, oh, you know, we, we've done that, we move on. Now, you know, as I but said... But the, the reality is much different, though, isn't it? The reality is, 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 is very different, but not in the way that we all assume it is. You know, if you look, if you look at um, Asia-Pacific, for example, um, you'll find that um, uh, just... Out of the region's 33 countries, um, only, well, there are 10 countries that account for 
93% of the people living with HIV and AIDS. Mm. So you've got another 23 countries where the epidemic is probably more on a par with Australia's epidemic. So what we've been doing is, in a way, focusing in the wrong spots. We're still sort of thinking about it as the big threat of the generalised epidemic, which is kind of the way it was described in the 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 1990s and the 2000s. No one knew where it was going. There was a real fear for everyone. And and I'll be, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a political cynic and a realist. I've worked with them for too long. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why we were able to capture their attention because it was a fear that it was going to affect everyone. And now it's, it's evident that it's really very much focused amongst key affected populations. And so how do we encourage them to be supportive of those key affected populations? And this is where human rights, even more than financing, is, is really vital. UNAIDS is doing a really interesting um, piece of work. Actually, it's being done by the Kirby Institute, but UNAIDS has commissioned them to look at the, the financing um, of uh, HIV in Asia Pacific over the next little while. And I think one of the important things to notice is that there is quite a growth in domestic financing for HIV. So, for example, China, which as of next year will no longer receive any global um, fund financing for its HIV and AIDS work, mm. is actually, it is stepping up to the plate and it will fund everything. So it will be 100% funder of its own HIV response. Which is, which is remarkable, Really, but what what's different about their like what what's different about their attitude to other parts of the world? Like, why is it that that is something that is happening in China? Well, it's not just happening in China. Mm. That's the thing. Mm. Um, it's also it's it's happened in Malaysia. Yeah. It's happening in India. It's happening in Thailand. You see, what again? It gets back to this broader this broader area of international development. Um, the first MDGs, Millennium, first Millennium Development Goals, says, you know, let's halve poverty by the year 2015. That happened five years ago. And mm -hmm. It's not even 2015. Yeah. So, you know, you've got this situation where you've got um, low-income countries are quickly becoming middle-income countries. Uh, poverty is within their own borders, but they are also far more um, financially resourced themselves through their own efforts, by the way, um, and in a, in a far better administrative position to be able to deal with the development priorities on their own plate, and that includes HIV and AIDS. Now, China's a, you know, that's a no-brainer, that one, isn't it? I mean, in terms of mm. where it is internet, globally, the second biggest economy in the world yeah. and, and hard on the heels of the, the biggest. So, you know, you'd have to ask the question, why? Is it that funding completely its HIV response, not um, why is it going to? So, you know, China's obvious. India's had, um, you know, India's really sort of focused significantly on its own HIV epidemic, and it too is increasingly dedicating its own domestic resources um, to, to, to that response. And, and the trend there is that it continues to grow. Thailand is another middle-income country that uh, you know is uh, is is largely not completely but largely funding its own response. Malaysia has for some time, but Malaysia has been um, a, a so-called developed country for for quite a number of years now. So again, you know, you you would expect it to. Um, this is the thing. We we have to, in a way, stop thinking of these countries as as we might have thought about them in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, you know, developing countries needing external support. What they need is support with, with developing the political leadership and improving the, the, um, the human rights position for the key affected populations. Let's be frank. When we look at the key affected populations in a number of these countries, they're sex workers, they're men having sex with men, and they're injecting drug users. Mm. You know, they are three communities that often sail close to the law, if not beyond the law, in those countries. And this has a real impact on their ability to access the services and the treatment that they absolutely need. And the re 
reason they can't access them because if they if they if they put their hand up there is a real risk and in many cases it's very likely that they will be charged and sent to a prison sent to a rehabilitation camp etc cetera, etc cetera. so the issue here firstly financing you know if if the financing was targeted more on the key affected populations you know at the moment i think oh, i'm grabbing the figure from my head but mm. it's around about 8% of the total HIV funding in Asia Pacific goes to the key affected populations. You know, where's the rest going? It's being it's being wasted. It's not focused. It's not targeted. So it's not just a case of more money. In fact, in Myanmar, for example, um, studies being done by Kirby Institute show that if they maintain the same amount that they are receiving now, they will meet. The, um, the UN, the 10 UN targets for HIV and AIDS. So, you know, by 20, by uh, 20, uh, 20. So, you know, this is, this is important. It's not, it's not necessarily a case of more money. It's a case of better money, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I mean, there's some uh, really, um, in some ways, encouraging and very interesting um, statistics there. What about here in Australia, I mean, when we look at the, the new Australian government and uh, their commitment to funding, how can you, um, com- what can you say about that? Are you talking international funding? Well, yeah, and also local funding, but um, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, I'm not going to get into the local funding. It's, mm-hmm. it's really not an area that uh, I've, I've focused on. My expertise is international and international yeah. development. Mm. Um, look, in terms of the international aid budget for Australia, you know, uh, it's it's difficult to know what's what's going to happen with that. Um, there is a, um, um, a funding meeting for the Global Fund, um, I think it's next week, and uh, I think that will be the first indication of uh, of what Australia under the under the new government is uh, is prepared to do for HIV and AIDS. But, you know, 2014 is coming to Melbourne, so, you know, one can be hopeful that that will encourage them to to maintain this effort. You see, um, I think I think it's very important that that everybody, government, civil society understands a got to be better spent money, there's no doubt about that. Got to make sure it's targeted. But also, you know, if we step away now, all the great gains that have been achieved are likely to be lost. So, you know, we're, we're really getting into, I would hope, the last lap or the last two laps. And now's not the time to hold back. Now is the time to actually, you know, really invigorate the response to ensure that um, it's, if it's not tamed, if it's not defeated, at least HIV is tamed. There's, um, I mean, that's such an imp- important point there. Um, just a, a bit of feedback uh, coming through uh, on Twitter. David agrees with you, Amory, and says there's far too many competing, uh, that uh, too many other competing priorities is not a good enough excuse. What do you think about that? Ah, uh, well, you know, um, if 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 you're if you're in the middle of, of trying to do something for for something as important and as worthwhile as HIV, I can certainly understand that. But you know, people are dying from other diseases as well, so it's it's really hard to um, to. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to have to make that decision. Frankly, I really wouldn't have to make want to make that decision. And and what's the the next step uh, in this uh, discussion? Do you think? Well, you know, with um, with AIDS 2014, but importantly, you've got uh, 2015 is the is the end date for mm, the Millennium Development sure. Goals, and there will be some sort of framework that follows it. Um, HIV won't be a headliner in the in the new post 2015 agenda. That's that's already pretty clear. Um, but what's going to be important is that this amazing global response that has been brought together over the last 30 years doesn't lose their energy, its energy, and that um, even if HIV isn't a headliner in in an international development agenda, which I think won't have much currency internationally anyway mm. by 
by the way. It's uh, it's just a carry on and carry on the you know it's, it's like the second film. It's never usually as good as the first one. <laughs> For um, sure. So you know I've I've been encouraging people not to get too anxious about where HIV sits in the new international development agenda. Mm. The world is not the 1990s anymore. It's very different. It's the economic profile is entirely different. So we have to think differently about how how to, to galvanise the, the human and the financial resources to, to actually deal with it. But, you know, I really do think that um, addressing the human rights and inequality issues is one of the biggest challenges, and that's the one we really need to be focusing on. Indeed. Well, Amory, thank you very much. There's uh, so much within this topic. It feels like we could uh, go on talking, but um, I'm very, very thankful for you uh, joining me this afternoon. It's an important conversation. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. This is uh, Glenn Dalton uh, talking all about uh, funding in relation to uh, Worldwide AIDS Day Worldwide. More about this topic after these messages. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. World AIDS Day Worldwide. Uh, this hour we're talking about where we headed in relation to funding. Where does the funding come from and where does it go? If you want to join the conversation, please do or check out the website worldaidsdayworldwide.org where you can see Vision live from the studio. Big hello to uh, Michael Dalton who is listening from Vietnam and uh, says he's immensely proud of Joy. Thank you for your support. Now, uh, earlier this week, um, Christoph Ben was uh, interviewed by Byron Andy. Uh, Christoph is the Director of External Relations uh, at the Global Fund, which is a World AIDS Day Worldwide Project partner. Um, they spoke about funding. Let's hear that interview now. Uh, Christoph Ben, uh, you're from the Global F uh, Fund. Uh, do you want to just tell us a bit about where your money comes from and how you... Uh, fight against HIV across the globe? Sure. I mean, the, the, the Global Fund was created 12 years ago to help countries around the world to finance their fight against HIV AIDS, also, of course, including tuberculosis and malaria. And uh, we've been able so far to approve grants worth $27 billion for around 150 countries around the world and the money is coming mainly from governments um, you know the kind of governments like the US uh, Europe Japan Australia uh, but increasingly also so you know emerging economies contributing to the global fund some of the implementing countries contributing themselves it's like a kind of global pool where everybody should contribute according to their um, you know abilities we're getting also um, significant resources from foundations um, you know, uh, most prominent among them, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, other private sector companies, high net worth individuals. We recently had the first major gift from an Indonesian uh, businessman who contributed $65 million. So it's really a kind of global pool that was created by the international community to help ensure that everybody around the world can have access to prevention, care and treatment so that this should not depend on where you live, where you were born, whether you're rich or poor, you have a right to health and you deserve to receive the best possible prevention, care and treatment services. Fantastic. And you've mentioned a couple of the bigger players. Who are some of the other countries that you'd like to see input into the global fund and the, the work that you do? Right. I mean, you know, the, the number one donor is the US and uh, as I said, you know, the, the others are the major European donors, Japan. Uh, but certainly uh, we want to expand, you know, to receive more funding from, from let's say, the G20 countries. Um, just last week, actually, Korea, uh, South Korea doubled its contribution to the Global Fund, which is great. Uh, we are expecting some contributions next week when we have our replenishment conference in Washington, D.C., uh, from China, from, from India, from Thailand, actually, it will make a pledge. Um, and obviously, we hope also from, from Australia and New Zealand. Beautiful. And I guess with the Global Fund, where does a lot of your money go to? Uh, what are the countries in need most of the, the money that you raise? I think it's very important to say we are a truly global fund. Uh, so we are supporting programs on all co continents, meaning all countries that belong to the low income and middle income uh, bracket, they can receive funding. A lot, of course, goes to Africa because that's where the poorest countries are, that's where you have the highest disease burden, particularly on, on HIV AIDS. But a significant part of our funding goes to the Asia and the Pacific, um, because you have many countries in need there as well. 
Um, you have a pretty high disease burden in, in, in many countries, um, HIV, TB and malaria, of course. So it is very important also to, to convey to the Australian people uh, who are you know, naturally more concerned about the Asia Pacific that we, for example, have already approved you know, grants uh, worth $3.2 billion in this region. And uh, this is quite critical because many of these countries would not be able to finance these programs. It's a sad fact that, you know, in some of the Asian countries, access to ARVs, for example, is lower than some of the African countries. Um, maybe because th there's not kind of this uh, political will, I would say, to, to really implement that. Also, we know that in Asia and the Pacific, we are dealing very often with more concentrated epidemics, um, you know, affecting um, very marginalized and vulnerable populations like men of sex with men, people who, who use drugs and so on. So it's quite a different epidemic, if you like, uh, from that in Africa. And we have to make sure that also these programs are financed that are reaching the, the most vulnerable populations. You've worked well alongside the UN to the United Nations. Uh, how, tell us about the relationship that you have with those guys, or the people at the UN rather, and uh, I guess how they enhance or your work that you do. We, we are working very, very closely with, with our UN partners. Um, you know, in, in terms of HIV AIDS, obviously we are working very closely with UNAIDS. Uh, UNAIDS is the agency that, you know, provides strategic guidance to, to many countries around the world. They have a country presence there. They help to support the implementation of, of the programs on the ground. Similarly, with the World Health Organization, they provide the kind of technical assistance, the normative guidance to the countries. By the way, the Global Fund doesn't have any country offices. We are not present you know, in these countries. We are a financing institution. So we are providing the money. The UN agencies are on the ground. They help the country is design their programs, implement the programs, but on the other hand, they don't have the money. So it's a very kind of complementary role, if you like, uh, between the UN and the Global Fund. Beautiful. And um, I guess that's worked for the last eight years, yeah? You're, you're from Germany now, um, Christoph, and I just want to know, where else are people or members of the Global Fund based across the world? Actually, uh, the, the interesting thing is we are only based in Geneva. Uh, that's a very strong principle. When the Global Fund was created 12 years ago, we wanted to keep the administrative costs as low as possible so that the money that we mobilize really goes to support the programs. Therefore, we never considered to offer open offices outside Geneva. We are, you know, headquartered here. We have, uh, you know, colleagues from all over the world. Well, actually, we have, uh, you know, staff members here in Geneva from about 100 nations. So it's a very multicultural organization, but we are based in Geneva, working from here to support the countries around the world. Okay, what are some of the positive outcomes that you can highlight to our listeners out there in terms of the work that you do, Christoph? I mean, I think, you know, with this investment over the last 10 years, we've seen enormous progress in the fight against the three diseases. Um, We've seen, um, you know, new infections and actually deaths from HIV coming down on, on all continents, uh, in many cases quite impressively. Um, and if I might take an example from, from your region, if we're looking at Cambodia, you know, we have dramatic declines here. AIDS cases have gone down by 50%. Tuberculosis cases have gone down by 45%. And, and even more impressively, uh, the number of people dying from malaria has gone down by 80% in Cambodia. And I could quote similar examples, you know, from, from the Philippines, from Vietnam, and from, from many countries around the world. So these are, in public health terms, not small improvements. These, the, these are revolutions, if you like. Um, the, the fact that we've been able to make both prevention and treatment available to large populations has really changed the face of the epidemic. So, so this is very positive. On the other hand, we also know that still there's a lot to be done. Um, we think we are now in a position that, that we can say, if we continue like that and if we receive more funding, we can finally defeat AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. That's something we would not have been able to say, you know, just a few years ago. Um, but now we are at this really historical point, I would say, that, that we can drive these epidemics down to a level where it's not a kind of public health threat anymore. So that's the kind of opportunity that we have. But we need to keep investing and we need to keep, you know, to be vigilant. Because if we don't do that, these epidemics come back. And as we said before, particularly in Asia, where, where you have you know, pockets of still high infection rates, uh, where you have pockets of people not having access to prevention services, not having access to treatment, 
treatment. This is a very dangerous situation. So um, that, that's why we are appealing to the world, including to Australia, you know, support us in this effort. If we all work together, we can defeat AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. But we need to keep going. Otherwise, we might lose this fight. Globally, we've experienced a global financial crisis. How has that impacted on the work that the Global Fund has been doing since the uh, crisis has begun? Like, has that had an effect on your work? It has had an effect. I mean, in, in the first couple of years after we were created in 2002, the Globe Fund, you know, has been growing very, very rapidly, also in terms of the resources we had. Since uh, 2008, eight nine, when the global financial crisis hit, our, our resources have been more or less stable. So fortunately, we have not suffered from any kind of decrease. I think that there was a lot of confidence in the Globe Fund and in the results that, that we are achieving together with partners that it's worth investing. That's a really good investment in, in the health of people. So that has helped us to kind of at least keep the level of resources. We currently can invest around $3.5 billion per year. So that's quite good. But as I said, if we really want to defeat the diseases, then we need more resources. And we hope now the world is coming out of this uh, financial and economic crisis and therefore, we, we hope that in the next few years, through our replenishment, uh, we will be able to invest more um, as countries are providing more resources for us. Now, we understand that Australia is still, uh, I guess, yet to uh, top up their commitment to the funds. Can you just maybe speak to that, um, what their commitment has been like in the past and what ideally you'd like to see from the Australian government uh, in the future? So Australia has contributed uh, for the last three years, the current replenishment, about 200 million uh, Australian dollars to the Global Fund, and we are very grateful for that. We will have a re replenishment conference on December 2nd and December 3rd in the US, hosted by the US government. Um, and we've been asking our donors to provide the funding now for the next three years, 2014 to 2016. And we've asked them to provide on average a 50% increase because that's the amount we need to achieve this historical breakthrough that I've been talking about to really defeat the three diseases. So we hope that the Australian government, and we understand it's a new government, you know, that had to kind of review probably the global fund and its position, that it will be in a position on December 2nd or December 3rd in Washington, D.C. to announce what they are going to provide for the global fund. And we obviously hope that it will be a generous increase over what they've been doing so far. Yep. And just, I guess, give us a bit of an indication. What's your work going to be like over the next three years? And I guess, when do you want to stop working? When would you like to think that, um, I guess, you've defeated the, the things you want to achieve? How long do you, what sort of time frame would you put on that? Right. Indeed, you know, right. I mean, uh, obviously, our, our goal is to work ourselves out of business. And in, in some countries, that, that will work. I mean, for example, we've been supporting AIDS programs in China, you know, for a number of years, because before the Global Fund, you know, helped them, there was basically no access to kind of prevention services for their kind of most affected populations, nor treatment services. So we've worked with China, we've provided resources, now the programs are up and running. But uh, next year is the last dispersion from the Global Fund to China. We've been phasing out over the last few years. We will stop that. And China will continue themselves then to fund that. That I think we will see in a number of other countries over the next few years as well. So more and more countries will graduate out of the support from the Global Fund. Now, you know, when will we be able to stop, you know, working? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I look forward to the moment that we can say, you know, everybody has access to prevention, care and treatment and they don't need the Global Fund. This will take a while, particularly for the low-income countries, and, and you have some in, in the region as well. You know, I think countries like, like uh, Timor-Leste and, and uh, Myanmar and, 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 and uh, Bangladesh and so on, they will continue to, to receive some funding from the Global Fund until the time that they can afford, you know, co comprehensive services themselves, and then we would be happy to phase out. Beautiful. Well, thanks for your time, Christoph. Uh, that's Christoph Ben from the Global Fund. Um, actually, if people want to find out more information about what the work you, that you do, could you just give us a, a bit of a plug for a website? Sure. I mean, you can visit our own website at www.theglobalfund.org. Um, but we've also provided some information for you. I think uh, that will be accessible through your website. Uh, so you can look at some of the slides with our latest results with our investment in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, with some of the successes that I've been talking about. So, and if you want uh, more information about the Global Fund, you know, uh, you can certainly come to our website anytime uh, and you will find very comprehensive information there. Beautiful. Well, thanks for your time, Christoph. Uh, that's Christoph Ben from the Global Fund.
appreciate that. Thank you. All the best to you. Bye-bye.